I have been talking over the last month in a certain vein, in a certain vein. I, I started by talking about baby believers. And, and, and that wasn't to minimize who you were. It was to remind you of who you were, that you have to come to the, the Lord as a baby. A baby believes. Do you believe? Do you have the kind of faith where you truly believe that your daddy can do anything but fail? Baby believers. Now, we start as a baby believers, but then we have to grow to where we desire the sincere milk of the word that we can grow by there. And now we should be eating meat, but some of us are still baby believers and we're old Christians. And I called and challenged you to grow up in the things that God called us to do. I talked about no more lame excuses. We talked about the man sitting at a beautiful place, but he had a bad condition. And some of us look good, but on the inside, things aren't good. And so we look like we got it together. But if I were to go home with you, I would find that you just look good, but you're living in a bad condition. And But don't allow your condition to determine your faith. Don't acquiesce your faith to your condition. God wants to change your condition through your faith. And, and then, and then uh, lastly, I was talking about the man that sat outside the gate and, and uh, he was making all of the excuses. And then I talked and Aaron changed my message and he said, Re repent and return to church. But I started off by preaching, uh, get up and come in the church. But when I started preaching it, it really began to let me know that uh, there is a, a change of heart that has to take place. And then transition takes place. And many times we're making excuses why God is trying to change us and cause us to transition. Change happens instantly. Transition is a mental process. And then we start seeing so is our Christian walk. When we repent, that's a psychological word, meaning that my mind has to change. Even after I confess with my mouth, believe in my heart, I am changed as a believer. But now I have to transition. I have to transition in my thinking. I have to transition in my acts. I got to get my, my actions to, to conform to my mindset. And I, I need to remember that the way that my mind is going to change is not by me continually doing things. I've got to get my mind to change because without my mind changing, my actions can't change. And I'm transformed by renewing renewing my mind today in looking at that message I was talking about Elijah Elijah this great man of God and we were looking at that many of us have the same problems but we don't recognize that when we're having that problem it doesn't make us small because we're dealing with issues of life we had to be reminded that Elijah was a man just like us. And why? Because this was the kind of man that could sit down and pray a prayer and God would shut up the heavens for three and a half years. I, we need to be reminded that it was Elijah that I was talking about because Elijah was the kind of Christian believer that could tell a woman that God is going to give you a child and God gave the child and watch that when the child died Elijah laid hands on the child and the child rose back to life this is the kind of man that God gave him so much faith that when God brought a famine God spoke to him and said go down by the brook I'm going to leave you by the brook in the midst of a famine and I'm going to call a ravenous raven a, a dirty bird to bring you meat and, and you can I'll survive you or cause you to survive in a brook with a dirty bird with, with a bird that goes against its nature, I'm going to make it go against its nature to feed you. 
I need you to understand who Elijah was. He, this man had the kind of faith and the kind of anointing on him that God says, go to Seraphath, and there's a woman there, and she's about ready to commit suicide because in the midst of the famine, all she's got is a little bit of meal left and some oil, but go speak to her and tell her if she'll have faith to feed me first, you'll never run out. This is the man that I need you to understand I'm going to talk about today because you need to know that he was a man. He was a human being just like you and I. Because sometimes when we're going through, you feel like you're the only one. God, why me? Why am I going through? Just saw two beautiful people who look healthy, but their heart was attacked. Somebody say, but God, but God. And sometimes when we go and we find out God has been keeping us, sometimes we find out we done had strokes, we done had heart attacks, but God stepped in the midst and you didn't even look like what you've been through. The devil will have you forget about that and only think about what you have not and never about what you have. Somebody give God a praise for what you got. Even though your kids are bad, go ahead. You got bad kids. Thank you, Jesus. God ain't through with them. They bad because of you and their nature. But don't give up on them. I'm a living testimony. Hallelujah. We see Elijah this mighty man and in and, and, and chapter 18 he's been on Mount Carmel you know the story he has had 450 prophets of Baal that were killed at his prayer then as we get into chapter 19 I'm going to read from verse 9 through 15 but I need to give you this background because I hear the Lord saying something to the church today and I hope you get it I hope you get it he, he, in verse number 19, uh, verse number 1 through uh, 14, I, I don't want you to go there yet. Thank you, Aaron. You all over it. I love you, man. I love your spirit. Keep it up. He has called down fire. The prophets have been consumed. Then Jezebel hears about what Elijah has done, and she sends a messenger to him, and all of a sudden, he starts running. He starts running away from this woman of God. And he runs until he runs and leaves his, his armor bearer at Bathsheba. And he goes out into the wilderness and he's sitting under a tree. He's asking that God would take his life. You ever had anything happen so bad in your life? You don't want to live anymore. You were hurt so bad. You were so greatly disappointed you don't even want to live anymore God how am I going to get through this you took my husband you took my child you took my mom you took my dad you took the job you took the relationship and you said God I don't even know how that's where this great man of God was and I need you to see it because one of these days you might be there too and I need you to know don't give up on God because God won't give up on you God didn't just bring you to it he's going to take you through it you have to trust God somebody say trust God trust God trust God so we find that he has gone out and the angel of the Lord has come to him twice and told him get up and eat and, and fed him miraculously and then he runs and goes to Mount Horeb and we pick up at verse number 9 in chapter 19 come on Aaron and he came thither unto a cave and lodged there and behold the word of the Lord came to him and he said unto him, watch this, what doest thou here? What are you doing here, Elijah? You ever felt like that guy? How did I get here? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thine prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left and they seek my life to take it away 
And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, here it is. He says, the Lord was a small, still voice. And it was so. When Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, what doest thou here? What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? And he said, I've been, he's practicing his same old excuses. I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. I'm left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on the way to the wilderness, to Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. Today, I want to speak from the thought what to do when you don't feel it, when you're not feeling it. I, I, I would almost say, uh, I'd almost want to come and say what to do when you ain't feeling it. But I, I know that I've got some broken English and some of you all may be embarrassed because you bring your well-educated friends and they say, your pastor can't do any better than that. But I gave you the, the right verbiage, but way I feel it is, what do you do when you ain't feeling it? What do you do when you ain't feeling church, when you ain't feeling Christ, when you're not feeling teaching, you're not telling, feeling word? What do you do when you just ain't feeling it? You don't feel like being a husband. You don't feel like being a wife. You don't feel like being a worker. You ain't feel it. Don't call me Christian. Call me bitter. What do you do when you ain't feeling it, Charm? When you look it, but you ain't feeling it. When you're in the position, but you don't have the passion. when you have done mighty acts of the Lord, but you ain't better, you ain't feeling this. This thing is harder than I expected. That you're asking too much of me, God, after all I've sacrificed. I got to the church at seven this morning. I did all the stuff to set up, and then somebody comes in to see one thing out of place, and all they can do is tear me down. I ain't feeling it. I don't want to do it no more. What do you do when you ain't feeling when God doesn't look like he, he has kept score of all the things you sacrifice? Sometimes we start making lame excuses, but I need you to understand the Bible says this mighty man had done all of these acts, but the enemy is after your faith. He, he, listen, th we are a church of great faith. We believe against the odds. We believe that God can do anything but fail. We, if you come to this church, you're going to hear about faith and more faith and more faith. We, you're going to hear about falling, but get back up in your faith. You're going to hear about setbacks, but stand back up in your faith. You're going to hear about being a castaway, but don't drift away from your faith. Don't let go of your faith. Hold on to your faith. We are a church of great faith. I make no apologies. I read somewhere without faith is impossible. Please the God that we serve. I need you to know what do you do when you don't feel like doing it? You need to know that the enemy is after your faith. The Bible says that Jezebel, look at verse number two and three. Pull that up for me. The Bible says Jezebel sent 
Underline the word messenger in your Bible. She sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as this, as the life of these. Go ahead. Of one of them by tomorrow. Go to the next verse. And underline this. When he saw that, when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. Look up. Thank you, Aaron. Jezebel sends a messenger not to assassinate his body, but to attack his mind. She sent a message to attack his mind. If Jezebel was going to kill him, she would have sent an assassin to kill him. Ha! The enemy is sending a message to attack the mind of the believer. She attacked his ego. She attacked his position. She sent a messenger to assassinate his image of who he was. I wonder how many times the enemy have told you you're not getting this breakthrough because you're not worthy of it. You're not good enough. Have you ever gone to an interview and you thought you didn't do very well at all and you beating yourself up because, oh God, it's just like me to fail again. And then three days later, they call you and offer you the job. The enemy comes. What do you do? He comes to attack, assault your mind. She says, I'm going to kill you, but she doesn't send an assassin. She sends a message. She sends a word. And watch what the scripture says. And when he saw it, the messenger said it. He saw it. What is it that you are seeing based upon what the devil is saying? You're never going to make it. You're never going to be you're never going to be healed. God has forgotten about you. It's something. We know that the just must live by faith, but there comes a place where we we don't live by faith. We live really by feelings and we allow our feelings to impact our faith instead of our faith instead of our faith impacting our feelings. What do you do when you don't feel like it? You do it by faith. You do it by faith. You do it by faith. Somebody say, do it by faith. Hey, hey listen, say it again. Do it by faith. Make it personal. Say, I need to do it by faith. Yeah, and you know what it is that you're talking about. You know what it is. He wants to kill your faith. Jezebel says, I'm going to send an emissary. I'm going to see send a representative. I'm going to send an ambassador from my kingdom to attack you in your kingdom. And we were talking about the kingdom of heaven and we are children of the kingdom of heaven. We have to know that death and life lies in our tongue, but it also lies in our mind. You, Whatever you bring into your mind, you will become a slave to it. What is the enemy said? that has talked you out. He's given you a problem that's so great that the, the problem is bigger than God's promises. You say, wait a minute, God, I'm not going to believe that you can do exceedingly and abundantly. Somebody who has a great authority, I believe that Elijah looked at her reputation. This woman had a reputation for scheming and conniving. Look, when Israel split from the north kingdom to the southern kingdom the, the, the southern kingdom is where Jerusalem was where the priest was so what did Jezebel do she set up her own priest she set up 450 false prophets she set up her own temple so they wouldn't have to go down south and this woman was a schemer and a conniver maybe you've given more difference to the schemes and the strategy of Satan than you believe in the power and the promise of God she didn't send something to kill his body she sent something to attack his mind some of us 
don't feel it. The enemy's attacking your marriage and you don't feel like it. Yeah. You don't feel, you don't feel, yeah, I, I don't feel, when he comes in the room, I don't feel nothing but disgust and my heart doesn't skip a beat. If it does, it's arrhythmia. That ain't good. Your heart should not skip beats. It should not speed up and slow down. But you've gotten so caught up in your feelings, you don't know that real love is passion. And passion, not fingertips and lips and hips. No, passion is sacrifice and giving somebody what they don't deserve because you got something you don't deserve and you will reap what you sow. The reason you're getting all this mess We find out that what do you do when you don't feel like it? You start running. Running. Running after your old stuff. Running. 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 Here's the prophet of God with all of this power. Running. A, a prophet with power becomes a prisoner. He's done all these great things. And maybe you say, well, if God had done all those great things with me, I, I would I would I would not give up on it so easy. Wait a minute. You had a miscarriage. Now you got four kids. Go back and you first were not able. See, what has to happen is we've got to be able to trust God in the down seasons of our life in those in between places where you're on your way somewhere but you're not quite there and that's when your faith has a collision with the facts in your life. Your faith has a collision with the fear in your life. Your faith has to have a collision and still stand even though you're not getting what you feel like you deserve. Everybody goes that in between time, those low places. I don't, I know you've been in some low places. Some of you are in some low places right now. Some of us have that pit mentality, that low place where God hadn't moved yet. And you're saying, God, I'm waiting on you to move. And I prayed, I fasted, I've given, and I'm about to give up that low place where your faith has to have a collision with the facts, with the feelings, with the, with the fears still stand I'm reminded so many times we, we get into a pit and I heard somebody the other day use a good acrostic for pit she said it was a pause in transition the pit was a pause in transition I told you that many of us are looking for change change is an act transition is a mindset you look 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 as a woman you are a single woman then you get married you are a married woman and then you have a baby now you're a mother all of those changes have happened but the transition happens when you start thinking like a mother when you start thinking like a wife when you start thinking like a believer that's what God is after and sometimes we go through these temporary lulls before God brings you back up. Many of us can't handle the pits. That's why, that's why you say, I'm not feeling nothing. And you're getting ready to walk out on your seven year marriage, because I, I should be feeling something. But if you really got a chance to talk to folks who've been married a long time, they would tell you their season, you don't feel nothing but the passion of commitment and loving through the season, and it'll come back. Now, if y'all look at me, tell me, no, I ain't never, you stop lying. Stop, stop, don't do it. There's too many of us know the truth. Sometimes you're praying, God, I can't live without them. Other times, Lord, I can't live with them. Please, let him not come home today. Lord, just let him. Let her run off with the mailman. He's going to bring her back, but then let him go. Here's this prophet that has become a prisoner. Stop running in your feelings because of the facts in your situation. Yeah, 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 your faith is supposed to outlast those facts. Facts change every day. One day they say you're not qualified. Ten people tell you're not qualified. Keep on going. I believe you got to get ten no's before you get a yes. So it just means progress. No, no, 
no, no, no, no, no, no. And I start encouraging myself. I'm about to 10. I'm going to get one. When we wanted to get a loan for this building, building, we literally had to go to 11 different banks. All I need is one yes. All you need is one yes from the Lord about your situation. All you need is one yes from the Lord to turn around your disposition. One, just one, just one. Our faith must be able to stand up in the emergency room of life. We, we just wanted to stand up in church, la di da everybody. No, no. It's got to go home with you. It's got to go in the pit with you. It's got to stand when nothing else seems to stand. You have to stop running to your feelings and stand in your faith. And I mentioned all of that about Elijah so you could know that God is not a respecter of persons. You would almost think that God would do all those great things, then he wouldn't have to go through anything. Where did you get that myth from? You could not have read this Bible because Jesus never sinned. But did they talk about him? So when you get talked about, you like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe they talk about me all I do you've done as much as Jesus and listen you have something to talk about give them something to talk about live your life in such a way that, that, that let them be a liar they gotta make up stuff that's not true about you let them let you Listen, they're going to talk about you, and I know how much it hurt. Boy, you, I used to get so hurt. I still get hurt by it, but I, I just don't go as low as I used to. You get disappointed, and after a while, you cannot get jaded, so you don't allow anybody to get, that can hurt you, because if you can't be hurt, you can't be loved. You can't be helped. You can't, you can't have fellowship. Jesus would tell Peter, you a devil. Get ye behind me. Then turn around and use him as the first mega preacher. Stop running in your feelings. Understand that God is up to something. Understand that you've got to go through that valley called in between. Between where God is calling you to and where God is calling you from. And God has laid it out in the promises that he's given you, but you're still in the problems of your life. You've got to be able to stand in your faith in that place called in between. And we all have to. And, and uh, faith and unbelief are not mutually exclusive. You don't just have all faith and all unbelief. In your day, you go through all kinds of feelings. You feel good about it? You don't feel good about it. What, what we have to do is regardless of what we're feeling, we have to look to what God said beyond, watch this, what we can understand. Because don't tell me faith is the substance of things hoped for, so it's not based on what I can see. It's what I need to be able to understand in my mind. God is saying to us, what do you do when you ain't feeling it? How many leaders have... Never mind. I'm not going to put you out like that. So often we are in the place that we're just doing it by faith. Look, look, mother. When you when <laughs> Here's a great example. When a mother has a baby, little bitty baby, that is totally dependent on you for everything. You know, you can't lay them on their back because you just got to feed them. You got to lay them on their side or lay them on their stomach. And, and you got to go check because he'll roll over and, and end up uh, killing himself just by regurgitating and being on his back. Mothers and fathers with newborns, they don't consider their feelings. They do what is required to give life. They do what is required to grow this thing up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. How is it that now you got your feelings and your feelings dictate what you do regardless of what your responsibility is? What do you do when you don't feel like doing? Stop running to your feelings. 
because what it'll cause you to do is start running after other emotions not based on God's provision, God's stability. You'll be caught in the tension between the conflict and the real resolution of it. And most of the times, that's where we are. We're in a conflict with what you feel, the chaos that's going on based upon what you believe. What do you really believe? We find out in the low places. Because you say, forget God. I'm going to run after this myself. I'm, I know how to fix this. Oh, I know how to fix this. And then the Bible says, Elijah runs off from his armor bearer. He goes into the desert. He falls asleep. The angel of the Lord sends an angel to touch him, to wake him, and tell him to get up and eat. Twice the angel does that. Get up and eat. And then watch what he does. He then gets up and he goes 180 miles to Mount Horeb, same as Mount Sinai. That's when the Lord comes to him in verse 9 and say, Elijah, what are you doing here? My next point, what do you do when you don't feel like it? Don't mix God's anointing for your assignment. Because you're anointed to do it, because you have the know-how to do it, doesn't mean that's your assignment. I hear people talk about, God, if that's what you want me to do, open the door. God, if that's what you want me to do, close the door. Because the door is open doesn't mean that's your opportunity. Because what he then says, you have been anointed. He goes 40 days fasting, walking 180 miles. He's going to Mount Horeb, the place of the consuming fire, the same place that Moses had gone and, and, and the, he was attention was attracted by a bush that was not burned and, and God calls him over. He goes to the same place that God had given the Ten Commandments. He goes to the same place as other miracles had happened. He goes looking for the answer when God say you're looking in the wrong place. Just because you are anointed does not mean that's your assignment. Doesn't mean that's your assignment. You're doing it because you want to do it. You can do it. You say, God, I, I don't like what I'm getting here, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm anointed to preach and, and teach and sing. I'll start my own church. They don't like me over there. Just because you are anointed doesn't mean that's your assignment. And, and he's got the proof. He says, an angel woke me up. Some of you all have the proof, the accoutrements of God's calling on your life, but your disobedience take you to do what you feel like doing instead of what God called you to do. You think because you're anointed, that's your assignment. He goes to a place because that's what he thought he needed. And what the Lord ends up telling him, he says, you were here on the mountain where you had the prophets killed. You went 180 miles south. He says, go back to the place where you start allowing your feelings to lead you because that's where your assignment is. You were in this place and when God was telling you to stand in your faith and you, sub, you submitted to your feelings and you lost things along the way. You've been running. You run off from people that love you, that people that are called to assist you, running because you are anointed, but you don't have the right assignment. And God is asking you, how did you get emotionally, mentally, and spiritually in the condition you're in right now? How'd you get there? What are you doing here, man of God? What are you doing here, woman of God? What do you mean? You have become a, 
a religious person. You only go to church because you were raised there, but you don't get anything from the service anymore, and you've gotten to the place that you only come every once in a while because you have grown cold, and you want to do the same thing that the layman was doing. He was looking, and everybody was looking to the pastor, and Peter and John said, don't look at us. We couldn't heal this man. It was according to God's power. You start looking at people. What's wrong with that one? I don't go no more because pastor screams too much and he sweats so much and he hollers. Ah, go find you somewhere where they, praise the Lord. Come. I want to tell you that the Lord loves you and all of your problems are going to be solved. You just got to love everybody. Don't worry. Be happy. And, 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 and yes, you will go through. But God will bring you through. Y'all love him? Give him a hand. My problem's too deep for that, man. I got too much, I got, I got too much going on in my life. I, I need somebody that can tell me God will make a way. And you have fallen over and over, but God is able. That's not to minimize anything else, but I'm trying to tell you we got too many issues to just sit back and wait on God. God is waiting on you. God is waiting on you. He says, I've given you something. Don't confuse the anointing of the gift I gave you. And, and come on, come on, Samson. You're going to go to shake yourself one day and find out I was not in it. He says, stop making excuses. Stop making excuses. He, he said, what are you doing here, man of God? And he begins to say, oh, I, I was jealous for you, God, and, and I'm the only one doing what you called us to do. Sometimes that self-pity about your problem keeps you further away from God and satisfied in it like you know you, if you nobody knows all I've been through all I've suffered and tried and nobody appreciates me God I did it for you and God said no you did it for yourself see because if we go back to verse 2 and 3 the Bible says he ran because he was fearful then God finds him in a cave and in some secluded place where he's having himself a pity party and he's eating misery cake. And, you know, he's sitting there and he's rehearsing all the things. You ever see yourself rehearsing all the stuff that's going on in your life while life isn't fair? Life has never been fair. If so, Jesus wouldn't have died. And even when Jesus died, he didn't fix all of the immediate problems. He gave the solution. But the two people on the cross, they died too. And there were people in misery and heartache, disappointment. But he, get, he died to give everybody the answer. He said, when I die, I'm, I'm no longer like a high priest that's offering sacrifices day and night night he says when I do it I'm the perpetual sacrifice I'm going to sit at the right hand of the father and when you start making prayers he's going to see the blood of Jesus on your name and he's going to send my Holy Spirit to unlock doors that men have tried to keep you out of and open doors that men have tried to block he says I will be just what you need me to be I'll be your comforter in the midst of the storm I'm the lover of your soul you may feel like you don't know nobody loves you he says I'll stick closer than any brother I will be just what you need me to be stop making excuses stop making excuses what are you doing here woman of God you're supposed to you're supposed to be mending things and you're standing back saying I've done enough I ain't doing nothing else what are you doing here man of God you say, we about to get a divorce because I need to be happy. I need, you know, she, she don't do it for me no more. And I have a right to be happy. So did Christ. 
he went to the garden of Gethsemane the pressing place but he had the same choice that you have but he decided nevertheless not my will but let thy will be done some of us are standing in the place where feelings are more important than the faith the feelings are more important than God's command the feelings are more important than standing on the word even though they persecute you and, and he says when they do it know that you are blessed because you're standing for my name so people can see you and say man did you see what they put her through but did you notice how she walked you never knew she was going through all of that man and that, what a testimony what a what what an example to follow and many of us want God to give us a testimony but we don't want the test we don't want to go through nothing God we just want it perfect we want a perfect little life we can have perfect little faith and they can deal with perfect little problems God says to us, he, he says, stop looking for things that excite your flesh. He says, go and stand. Stand at the mouth of the cave. Stand at the place of transition. I'm getting ready to take you out of this. But he says, you're so conditioned to looking for the wind. <laughs> Because we want God to do something big and mighty. You're looking for the earthquake. And God says, I'm not in that. You're looking for the fire. God says, I'm not in that. You're looking to be entertained. You're looking for something to excite your flesh. And God says, while you're going through Hades, while everything is storming against you, everything is screaming in your life. But I don't scream then. I whisper. Whisper your feelings oh. this is a whispering you know why it's a whisper because you don't want to do what he says to do he says hold your peace shut your mouth stop telling people give them half of your mind you ain't got no mind left shut up I'll fight your battle let them scandalize you don't defend you I will defend you but in the meantime your flesh said oh, oh, oh it's a lot to be on Oh, hold me, hold me, please. Somebody hold me. Ah, I got to hurt you. I got to cut you. I got to cut you. God said, no. No, I'm, I'm that little thing in you that said, it's going to go against your nature. It's going to go against your nature. Your nature is the last shout. God says, shh, shh. I'm speaking to you in this. I know you don't feel good because you want to do what makes your flesh feel good, but I want to break your flesh. I want to smash your flesh. I want to cause your flesh to come under surrender to me. He says, I'm doing it now. I'm doing it after you have run it after you have used your anointing to tell people, don't, don't judge me. I hear from God. But if, if you hear from God, you ought to be in alignment with God. And he says, I need you to know, Elijah, you've done all of these great things. He says, but you kept looking for greatness, but I'm a small thing. It was a small thing. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you thought it was you. Huh? Maybe your God is asleep. <laughs> call on him again. Maybe he's taking another call. And it was me that came down with your simple prayer. And now you can't hear me unless I'm shouting. And give, give me some music, Zach. Give me some music. He, unless I'm, unless he, the organ is going. Hey! Hey, yeah, hey, yeah. I, I, I need you to know God getting ready to work in your life. God getting ready to turn some stuff around. Somebody say, yeah. God says, stop getting caught up in stuff that sounds right stuff that entertains you he says I'm trying to says, I'm trying to speak to that little girl in you to cause her to be healed even though you can't 
even forgive the people that did what they did. God says, I want to speak to that. In your quiet comfort, he says, I, I want to whisper to you, I'll get you through this. People can look at you on the outside, but they don't know it was hard to breathe. I'll get you through it. And you may never fully understand. You may never fully understand why God is allowing some things. But I know this, he's after your faith. The enemy is after your faith, and God is after your faith. Give the Lord a hand, praise, stand to your feet. What do you do when you just ain't feeling it? You don't feel like being a mother. You don't feel like being a father. What do you do when you're a teenager and you think you know as much as your parents? But you love your life. But you feel like you ought to say something so they understand how smart you are. That's the same way we treat God. The same way you don't want your child you know much more than they do. You know the path they take. You can see your husband and you can see yourself in them. And you can point out that's his, that's his daddy. That's her mama right there. And y'all both know it. So like, yeah. <laughs> but God is trying to say to you, I need you to move beyond your feelings. I need you to move beyond your feelings. I need you to believe that he is. He took you to this pit, this low place to perfect that small thing that's on the inside of you. That is the key to unlock everything God wants to give to your life. He says, without that, you can't please me because I'm going to cause you to go places where your gift has not made room but I made the room for your gift you were not qualified but I qualified you you were not counted in but I counted you in he says I want to do something in your life that defies everything you've been through everything you nobody would think God would use somebody like you with all the stuff you did and all the stuff you were doing God says, don't get caught up. Don't get caught up. God has been waiting on you to come back, but you're still living in the, in the past and in, 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 the, in the debauchery that you did years ago. Why are you still paying for it when Christ already did? 